Howard Schwaber joins us. He's an associate professor of political science and legal studies at UW Madison. Thanks for being here. Good Thank to you see you, Howard. So, just get us started on what the what the entanglement is here legally and what we're looking at. Well, the very first thing to know is that this is in fact not a case about religious freedom. Uh, way back in 1990, the Supreme Court had a case where they said that just because you have a religious objection to a law, that doesn't excuse you from obeying it. And states have no obligation to give you an exception. So, actually, the argument today had no reference to religious freedom or free exercise. Uh, the case was argued entirely on free speech grounds. And the principle is that the baker claims that the anti-discrimination law compels him to express a message he doesn't want to compel. Mm -hmm. Now that gets a little bit tricky. Uh, there's a very old precedent from 1947 that says the government cannot compel you to express a view. Uh, that's why, in fact, that case was about the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm -hmm. And the court said you can't compel children to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And that was before the words under God were in the pledge. So it wasn't about that. It oh. was just about the government simply can't make you express a position that you don't share. Speaking, what if it's not so obvious as speaking? What if it's some kind of conduct? There, predictably, it gets a little harder. Uh, there are two cases. There was a St. Patrick's Day parade in Boston. Uh, and there was a case with the Boy Scouts. Some people might remember about Boy, Boy Scouts of America versus Dale. And in both of those cases, the court said that forcing an organization to allow association with homosexual groups would be compelled speech. And the reason was that observers would see their presence and conclude that the Boy Scouts and the St. Patrick's Day Parade were endorsing homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Just to make life even more complicated, <laughs> back in 1964, there was the operator of a barbecue restaurant called, I'm not making this up, Piggy Park. <laughs> and the owner of Piggy Park said he shouldn't have to serve African Americans because doing that would send a message that he approved of racial integration, mm. uh, and that was contrary to his values. And that was dismissed as, I quote, laughably frivolous. So we have sort of two polar ends of an extreme here. We have this barbecue case, which says refusing to serve customers uh, is absurd, mm -hmm. and you can't do that. We have the, the Boy Scouts case and the St. Patrick's Day case, which say, well, if having these people present would send a message to observers that you're endorsing something, that might be compelled speech. So the initial question before the court today was, is the creation of a wedding cake, is that something that sends a message? Is that communicative? Mm -hmm. uh, and, does the, and, and I suppose one way to ask it, when you see a wedding cake at a wedding, do you assume the baker approves of the wedding? Yeah. Uh, and this baker says yes. Mm. And then there's one more twist. Because that is, let's face it, not a very strong argument. And everyone recognizes it. Right. Uh, you don't automatically assume that everyone who was involved in a wedding, the florist and the baker and the right. person who provided the flatware, are all endorsing mm -hmm. a particular wedding, whether it's an interracial wedding or an interreligious wedding or some other potentially contentious thing. So the last piece of the puzzle, last twist in this case, is that the baker said, look, certainly I realize, I mean, through his lawyers, through his briefs, but the mm -hmm. argument is, look, certainly we realize uh, you can't have a general rule that anybody can refuse to serve anybody. But I'm an artist. Yeah. I'm not like a florist or photographer or even a regular baker. I'm an artistic baker. Mm -hmm. And so my cakes are my self-expression. And forcing me to sell one in this context would be compelled speech. And that's the point that today was all about. On, on one side, just the fact that the cake is there doesn't send a message. No observer is going to think anything about the baker. So there is no compelled speech. And the baker said, yes, but I'm an artist. And so for me, it is. So quickly, in the time we have left, the, you don't think this comes down to just Justice Kennedy this time, right? Why I don't is think that? It, I, I don't think it does, uh, or, it may, or it may, but it may not. And the reason is it's such a can of worms. Um, I can't begin to list all the situations uh, in which the observer's uh, perception counts, but for example, religious establishment cases. There was a case with a 10-foot high silver cross outside of City Hall. And the Supreme Court said that was not a violation of the Establishment Clause because observers wouldn't conclude that it was endorsing Christianity. And there are lots and lots of areas where on the one hand we say it's the observer that matters. And I don't think any reasonable person is going to say that at least a cake without words on it sends a message to observers about the baker. On the other hand, there is this claim that this is art. Uh, and, and so that's a can of worms that I, don't, I think several of the justices will be very nervous about opening. The last problem, though, is what's a workable standard? And I kind of just alluded to that when I said a cake without words on it. Mm -hmm. Are we going to start having constitutional rules that distinguish between whether a cake has words on it or what the words are or the color of the right. frosting? And no one wants to dive into that mess. Yeah. Well, please come back with us as this yeah. continues to evolve, uh, as we continue to follow what happens.
and make sense out of it for us yeah, because it is a lot to unload. Yeah, it, it really is. All Great right. to see you, Howard. Thanks for joining. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming today.